All right, welcome to Computer Science S76, Building Mobile Applications. My name is David Malin. I'll be your instructor for this summer.、Um, so, we have a lot of new toys up here、uh, today. So, I'm going to do my best not to embarrass myself by toggling between multiple machines and hitting this screen. So, please forgive if、uh, I look like a neophyte when it comes to this stuff. But、um, we do know a little something, at least, hopefully, about mobile applications. And that's why we're here.、Um, so, This course is primarily focused on the world of iOS. There are certainly alternatives out there, but the summer is only so long, so we thought we'd pick one platform and focus on two aspects of it namely, mobile web application development and native application development. And let's start there. What is meant by these two distinctions? What are we about to get into this summer? Okay, so browser versus standalone. So, a mobile web application is one that, of course, runs within the confines of the browser, which likely means a mobile web application is written in what language? Yeah, so HTML, CSS, and then if it's an actual application, presumably there's some programming language underlying it, so not just a markup language, so something like JavaScript. So, indeed, that'll be the trio of languages that we use for mobile web applications. And now, native applications, they don't run inside of a browser, so where do they run? Sorry? So, on the OS itself. So, there's this language called Objective C that Apple's used for some time, most recently in the context of iOS, their mobile operating system, with which you can write native applications, which are ones that once you've written the source code, you can compile them, so to speak, into、uh, object code or machine code. And that machine code runs natively on the CPU and on the operating system that's running on an iPod, on an iPad. Or on an iPhone these days. So, we're going to focus on both of these over the course of the next several weeks, though mostly on the native side of things, because indeed that's probably where the greatest returns are in terms of new material and challenges. But we will spend today and the first project in the course on the mobile web aspect. So, before we get there,、um, let's take a look at what we actually mean by this. So, let's start with mobile web. Here is a screenshot of a typical iPhone, and you can, of course, pull up Safari on the bottom there. And when you do, you might be inclined to Actually, visit a website like Harvard's here that's mobile friendly. So, the irony is if you go to harvard.edu, you don't actually get the mobile friendly version. You get the desktop friendly version. But if you guess and type in manually m.harvard.edu, m generally designating mobile, you do in fact get this site, which looks much more touch friendly. So, what does it take to actually make a mobile web application like this that's clearly conducive to actually interacting it with? Um, your fingers. So things are big enough to touch, text is big enough to read. What's involved in doing this? Well,、um, you all have probably come into this course with some background in HTML and CSS, maybe a little bit of JavaScript. But to do something like this, all you need is pure HTML, a little bit of CSS, and a little bit of savvy as to what tags and what properties actually underlie the little configuration details that make things much more mobile friendly, much more touchable, much larger at the end of the day. So here's an example of Harvard's site. It may look like these things are buttons,、uh, four buttons here, three buttons down, but all these are. Are pings or GIFs or JPEGs in image tags, IMG tags, with which you're probably familiar. They're laid out in some kind of grid fashion with a table or with a sequence of divs. And so they've just been optimized by the designers to be sort of conducive to being touched by one's finger. And the graphics have all been similarly designed in Photoshop, but they're like to fit in this interface. So at the end of the day, if we look underneath the hood at this website and look at its code, you're just going to see some fairly familiar HTML, CSS, and not all that much magic, but there probably are a few tags that underlie it that make It a little more mobile friendly, just like they do sites like these. You just take it for granted that when you pull up a site like Gmail or m.harvard.edu or dozens of others out there that you might use, that they come up in this web、uh, mobile conducive way. But it does take a little bit of savvy. So before we dive into anything approaching the native side of things, let's take a look at HTML5. So, if you've been programming HTML in some form for some time, you probably started out with earlier iterations, maybe even XHTML and various tags that have come and gone over the years. But HTML5 is now what's with us, and browser support is increasing for its several features. We won't dwell too much on the basics of HTML because I'll assume that you largely know those, but what we will do is try to solve at least one problem. But first, some canonical HTML. There we go, my first goof. All right. There's what lies ahead. So let's go to, let's say,、uh, this slide here. All right, just as I intended. So this is a mobile website that we've made for the course, Computer Science S76. And it's got two links lectures and syllabus. 
But odds are most of you can barely, if at all, see lectures or syllabus. And yet, this is just very simple HTML. In fact, what tags have I probably used in this website? I can show off that this thing does actually work on demand. So, we've used the anchor tag to actually have a, a link that's clickable in blue there. What other tags are probably there? What's that? So the list tag, so a UL tag for unordered list probably, an LI tag, and then the easy ones, HTML, body, head, title, and all of the other boring ones that probably underlie this page. But I haven't really told the browser that I should anticipate that this thing's going to be viewed on a mobile device. It's barely legible. And why is that? Well, most browsers assume by default, even mobile browsers running on our phones these days, that they're sized really for desktop computers. And just in case this is actually a real website with lots of graphics and text, your phone is going to show it at the default zoom level, which is not going to lend itself to actually seeing up close what the text is that you've actually marked up there. So how can we go about fixing this? What's the easiest kludge via which we can fix this problem? Enlarge the font size, right? We can uh, deploy some CSS. We can change the font size, the font family, any number of tweaks we can make aesthetically in hopes that it actually works. Unfortunately, then, if you then view the same site on a desktop browser, if that's also your goal, then the thing's going to look like the opposite problem has happened. So we need somehow to we need some way of telling the browser dynamically to size itself based on what the device actually is. And it turns out there's a way of doing this. So with one of these meta tags, which to date you might not ever have used, or if you've used them, you've used them for keywords or for descriptions underneath a web page, you can actually use them for other names, namely one called viewport. So name equals quote unquote viewport. And if we give it a content or just a value of this, width equals device width, you can probably infer from this what it's going to do. It's essentially instructing the browser that it should size the web page based on the device width, not some assumption of a typical web page, which might be 800 pixels, 1024 pixels, or even bigger these days. And literally, just by putting that in the head of my web page's HTML, I end up getting an example like this with no other changes. Much more readable, sizes to a reasonable extent. And this is one of the most useful things you can do, certainly for a text-driven website, in just making things work on your mobile browsers. Now, if we go back here, there's, it turns out there's a bunch of other things. And this might now explain why you've gone to some mobile unfriendly websites and have been driven nuts by the fact that you can't do what on some mobile websites on your phone. So you can't zoom. No matter how you try to pinch and zoom, it just doesn't work, frankly, because some idiot has disabled it by way of one of these meta tags by specifying that the minimum scale or the maximum scale of his or her website is, for instance, 1.0. That's the maximum and the minimum via which you might want to scale it. Now, the upside of doing something like this is that the site is probably going to look exactly the way the designer intended. The downside, of course, is that if your eyes are not consistent with the designer's vision, you're not, gonna even, going to, you're not even going to be able to override that setting. So some value, but also a frustration. So do bear in mind, too, that just because things work well for you on your own phone doesn't necessarily mean your users are going to be as enamored. But by far, the most useful at first glance for us would be something like this, and just solving that particular problem. All right. So let's take a look, then, at a more generalized web page. Let me see if I can master this yet. So here, I propose that this is the simplest possible web page that we can make in HTML5 that validates and at least has some bare minimum of content. So for those unfamiliar with HTML5, turns out it's probably simpler than the flavor of HTML with which you've been familiar. One, the doc type is no longer the atrocious, unmemorable thing that it was for some time with HTML4, with XHTML. It's quite simply open a bracket, bang, doc type, HTML. And then below that, you actually have the body of your web page. So this is called the doc type declaration, the document type declaration. And all this really is is a signal, a hint to the browser that's reading the contents of this uh, .html file, what version of HTML it is. Because if you've been uh, designing pages for the web for some time, you've probably run into various headaches with Chrome or Firefox or IE or other browsers because they all behave slightly differently. You might have come across something called quirks mode. And quirks mode essentially dictates how a browser 
uh, interprets certain patterns of HTML. And long story short, it's this doc type that hopefully these days will increasingly kick browsers into a standards compliant mode so that your pages work more consistently across multiple browsers. All right, but this here is a representative web page, but we can do more than this. Suppose that we actually want to infuse a bit of stylization, we can add this line here in yellow. Functionally, what happens now when a web browser visits a web page containing these contents as it parses the file, top to bottom, left to right? Tell a story, if you could, just in your own words, somehow involving the network, somehow involving whatever this yellow tag is that explains, for those less familiar, what this line of yellow text is doing functionally. OK, good. So it loads the file, styles.css, from the server, which turns out is just a text file. And in that text file is, as you might have guessed, CSS, or Cascading Style Sheet Rules. It does load it synchronously, top to bottom. So there is, in fact, an order to the tags in HTML, so that if you load a file here and then another one here, you can, in fact, assume that B is going to be lo uh, loaded after A, which certainly has its advantages. Though we'll see some problems that can nonetheless arise when it comes to this sort of uh, worry about synchronization. This this relation here is just telling the browser that the relation of this file to the rest of the HTML here is that it's meant to be a style sheet, so it should somehow be applied. And so inside of this styles.css file is your typical rules for fonts and colors and borders and all of that. And they are then applied to all of the elements, all of the tags subsequently in this web page. So that too is probably familiar, but we'll use this to our advantage as time passes, certainly to stylize things and perhaps solve some additional problems that might arise. In fact, let's go ahead and propose this. This website that we have here is pretty damn uninteresting. All we have is a super simple text-based website for the course. Not all that compelling, even though if we click through these various links on the course's website, we would actually get to the PDFs and the content that we want. But let's see if we can't stylize this a bit more so that we can make a web application look more like it's a native application, even though I have no idea yet how to write a single line of Objective-C. So let's try to make this look more like an actual application. So to do this, let me offer a brief aside on the ways in which you can approach development of web-based applications on your own Mac, presumably, but the same holds through for, true for PCs. Whenever you start writing in JavaScript code, if unfamiliar, it often uh, you often trip over a security feature of browsers, whereby if you try to run a JavaScript file locally that's living on your own hard drive, um, it's not going to run because the browser's trying to protect you against something that could very well be malicious. So you can work around this by changing Chrome settings or changing Safaris or uh, your various browser settings. Or we can solve this problem by just introducing an actual web server. Now, it would be a pain if we all had to go out and buy a commercial web host and maybe a domain name and actually put all of our files for the course and for this first project on some remote server. But we can actually replicate that idea even without having internet access ultimately by just running a web server on our own computer. So what I'm going to propose that you do for this uh, first project, which we'll talk about later, but what I've done here in advance is I've downloaded some free software called uh, XAMPP, uh, X-A-M-P-P. -P. And this is free software that actually exists for Mac OS, Linux, Windows, and probably a couple of other operating systems that once you figure out how to navigate its somewhat cryptic uh, pages of links, you can get down to the download page and download, in this case, the universal binary for Mac OS. And as an aside, for any projects, we would point you in this direction explicitly. You don't have to memorize all of these little details. But long story short, once I download this program, run it on my local computer, it will install free software called Apache. Apache is a very popular web server software that's used all throughout the world. And you can run it on your little old laptop in addition to PHP and MySQL, which also comes with XAMPP. But what's nice about this is that it gets you up and running super fast, even without having to tinker with your Mac's own built-in settings. So I did this in advance, and I ran the installer. And what that gives me is a program called the XAMPP Control Panel. So I'm going to go ahead and load this file here. And I'm going to get a very simple two screens. One is just a reminder of how to get started with this thing. And the other is just this little control panel via which I can start Apache. And we're not going to bother using FTP or MySQL. All we need is a place to put our files. I'm being prompted for my password there. And I should now see a green light, which indicates that a web server is running on my computer. 
Unfortunately, my computer here is not on the public internet. I don't even know what its IP address is, and it definitely doesn't have a domain name. So, how do I go about accessing with a browser, let's forget about phones for the moment, the web server that's now running on my particular laptop here?